I would now like to introduce today's presenters. We have Michael Jansen. He's the Chief Research Guru at Everest Group. As co-founder of our research practice, Michael offers profound insights and analysis to enterprises and service providers alike. He leverages his extensive experience identifying and understanding emerging trends to help organizations maximize their global service efforts. Michael is particularly well known for his ability to hypothesize clever and challenging ideas based on fact-based insights across business and IT processes, sourcing models, and industries. Eric Simonson is Managing Director at Everest Group. He has more than 20 years of sourcing strategy and global services industry analysis expertise as both a consultant and research analyst. His overarching goal is to ensure enterprises, service providers, and investors have a combination of fact and experience-based advice to make the most of their most important decisions. Salil Dhani is Vice President at Everest Group's Global Sourcing Practice. In his role, he leads client engagement, engagements across a broad range of topics, including location optimization, global in-house centers or shared services, benchmarking, peer intelligence, and talent strategy. He supports leading enterprises, shared services, service providers, and events, investment promotion agencies. All right, take it away, Michael. All right, thank you, Colin. Um, this is one of my favorite studies uh, of the year that we do, and uh, where we really look forward into 2019. And in this case, we've talked to lots of enterprises and are starting to get a feel for what their uh, perspective is on terms of optimism and uh, pessimism. And we also get to look and ask them about their issues that they're thinking about and challenges and, and some of the strategies they're looking to deploy to, to mitigate those challenges. Uh, a few months back, we did a similar uh, study with service providers, and in a couple of the slides, we will actually bring those uh, two points of view together in one slide. So you'll be able to see this kind of a enterprise view and a service provider's um, view as well in a couple of slides here. So let me turn it over to Salil. He's going to take us to the first set of data about the industry perspective on optimism. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so uh, starting with the, the first uh, point around industry optimism, uh, we asked a specific question around what do our uh, uh, you know what do our enterprises feel about 2018 and what's their sentiment about to, the performance uh, in this year and uh, interestingly enough and in almost uh, half of the enterprises feel very great about 2018 uh, the overall uh, uh, you know uh, optimism is very positive for 2018 and uh, even a third of them uh, felt that the uh, the uh, industry performed uh, as expected uh, and only about 16% felt that uh, uh, it didn't go you know, according to plan. So overall, the first message is that uh, the industry was fairly positive about 2018. Uh, the interesting thing to note here is that this sentiment was uh, quite similar to what we discovered when we also did the service provider study that Michael was referring to a couple of months ago. Uh, and as we head into 2019 and look about the, the plans for 2019, it's important to keep this context in mind. Okay. Uh, before we get into 2019, though, I just wanted to uh, make sure we do a poll uh, uh, about uh, what does this audience feel about 2019 as we uh, as we are uh, you know almost approaching the year end. So the poll question for all of you is: uh, What are your sentiments about business revenue uh, for 2019? And uh, there are four options here, and in some cases. Uh, multiple options may, may, may apply, uh, but we would really like you to select the single most applicable option. And the options are that you feel very positive about 2019. Uh, option B is that you expect some modest growth, mostly from new businesses or client groups. Option C is that you're cautiously optimistic about 2019. And then uh, uh, option D is that you're really worried about 2019 because you don't feel that the business sentiment is uh, is positive. So uh, we have the poll open and I would uh, like your responses to this poll, please. So, so well, I'm seeing a little bit more cautious here than what we got from our, our study participants here. I wonder if that reflects some of the, the recent headlines. Yep, yep. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and close the poll? Yep, so we are just closing the poll in the next five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. OK, 
Okay, uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see the result. The poll is closed, and uh, let's see what uh, the audience here felt about 2019. Okay, so so uh, so uh, you know, uh, as uh, uh, as Michael was also mentioning, uh, roughly half of the audience uh, uh, was uh, is feeling. Uh, that there will be a modest growth about 2019. They're expecting a modest growth, and uh, about 38% of the audience is feeling cautiously optimistic. Interestingly enough, only 13% of you are feeling very positive about 2019, and uh, and I think this is this is interesting because what I'm going to show you in the next slide uh, will be uh, uh, will be something which uh, which may interest all of you. Okay, so if you can go to the next slide, please. All right. So we we asked a very similar question to our uh, enterprise audience as well. And uh, interestingly, here uh, the response that we got was that uh, enterprises are even more optimistic about 2019. Uh, and what you can see here on the left is uh, the results, uh, you know, about our question on 2018 on the left, and on the right you see 2019 responses. Uh, and as you can see across both uh, the optimistic category as well as for the uh, marginal growth category, we see a much higher percentage. So, uh, you know, from the uh, from the poll, the the answer may be that uh, many of you feel that uh, you expect modest growth, but uh, but from the study, we actually felt uh, and we got the sense that enterprises are even more optimistic as they had in 2019. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I would I would I would jump in on there and say that. Uh, that's that's probably a headline-driven sentiment change there, just in the last three weeks so yeah. since we collected the data. So interesting here. Let's go on into the uh, what, what what people are. I don't think the issues will have changed, just maybe the sentiment. Let's talk about those issues here. And um, when we uh, spoke to enterprises, their top three issues that they were losing sleep were uh, one was adapting to new business models, and something we've been talking about for quite some time: the impact of digital e-commerce. Uh, all the things that can that are uh, uh, ch changing out there it's certainly has caused lots of sleepless nights for many executives. Uh, the second one was the impact of pro cost and pricing. I think this is a fairly new one uh, you know, on on the list here. Uh, we've certainly seen the benefit of low cost labor and low cost sourcing from India and China helping keep inflation down for quite some time now, for well over a decade. Uh, but as you'll see in the, some of the data we're going to show you here, there's an uptick there starting to happen, and certainly there's a little bit of a, a mystery out there with what's the tariff, what the tariffs are going to do uh, that, and there's some other mysteries we'll talk about. And then the, finally, the third one on here is talent shortage, and I'll, I'll, we're going to talk quite a bit more about this one. But I would just say that you know, in the 20 years that I've been a, a research analyst with senior executives, uh, talent has always been a challenge. But it's more of been how do I get top talent? And I think what you're going to see in our conversation and the data we're going to show you here, it's not just about getting top talent or getting the hot talent. It's going to become more fundamental and really becoming a uh, can you just get arms and legs to, to fill the, the seats that you need? And I think we're going to um, we're going to actually enter into where talent shortages are now much more chronic and it cause more challenges systemically through the organizations in the economy. So we'll talk about that as well. And there were a couple other things on here, uh, not changing the, uh, not really losing sleep over the decision making process seems to be moving pretty quickly. Uh, lack of product offering differentiation, not, not there. The, the 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 need to redeploy resources, again, those things aren't aren't causing pressure. People aren't worried about them. They're really worried about the new business models, the price and cost and talent. So what we're going to do is take each one of those over the next uh, few slides here, and we're going to show you some data. We're going to show you why these things are happening, and, and have Eric and I are going to have a little discussion around some of these uh, these topics. So, the first one we're going to look at from a business challenge is we're going to look at the retail industry. And so, as we look at the retail industry, we've been talking about the Amazon effect and uh, Amazon for well over a decade now, going way back. But we wanted to show you, you know, where it's where we're kind of Brick and mortar and e-commerce are starting to have uh, some some real live impact. So what we've done here is giving you the green bars is the number of retail store closures year by year. And if you kind of just draw a straight line across where most of the data points come out, they roughly around 3,000 store closures per per uh, per year, and that's just the normal uh, winners and losers of the retail industry. You did see back in uh, 2008 when we had the financial crisis. 
uh, we saw a significant drop in, in or significant increase in closures up to 7,000. But then what I've also done is I've overlaid um, the blue line on here to Amazon's revenue. And so if you look in the last two years, 2017 and 2018, and keep in mind, we've had a red hot economy, but it's really now where we had a breakout in the number of store closures. Okay, now we're, we're, we're clicking up eight, maybe even 10,000, 12,000 in 2018, that the numbers are, haven't been finally, haven't been uh, finalized in terms of the overall store closures tally there. But you do see a, dip, a significant increase here. And what you see here is the, uh, you know, the impact on malls and the, and the brick and mortars is, is now becoming very, very uh, real. Yeah, and I think the thing you, you've basically said, but just to underline is there's a lag effect. So you know, Amazon was influencing things for quite a while in terms of um, kind of the real, um, uh, basically killing off other models and or dramatically changing them has been, uh, has manifested itself more the last couple of years. Um, we've simplified this and uh, thought of Amazon just as a retailer in this context. You know, the reality is the same thing has happened, digital disruption in AWS and the IT services space. Uh, increasingly, it looks like, you know, similar thing may happen in, um, uh, in the logistics and uh, transportation space. Um, and with that, let's actually look at a couple other industries on um, slide nine. So, you know, the digital disruption of in the business models is, is happening across across the across the board. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple quick examples across these three and then note some themes and tie that into uh, what that means for the services industry. So in financial services, um, uh, everybody's heard about Bitcoin and, and we'll see see what really happens there. Um, there's also a lot of shared uh, lending um, uh, disruption. There's things like Robin Hood that may uh, disrupt uh, you know, trading. Um, the one I want to focus on first a moment is uh, micro insurance. Um, where people can insure very specific things um, for um, specific periods of time. Um, an example would be Trove, uh, which has uh, a range of different offerings, but also targets in particular photographers who have a lot of equipment and at various times it may be environments that are more risky than other times. And so you can kind of turn the insurance on and off when you need it, um, very mobile enabled. Um, so notice you know, very specific customer group, uh, new channel buying it. And also, interestingly, um, because insurance is more part of how someone lives and works, um, the, the nature for a relationship actually changes than what you traditionally think about of kind of a fire and forget insurance model. Um, healthcare um, would, would uh, note things like uh, new delivery models for how you can interact. Um, uh, personally, um, our family actually uses a service called Teladoc, um, where you don't have to necessarily go to the doctor, but you can actually have a phone call, maybe a, a a, a video share, a send photos, et cetera, um, makes uh, getting certain types of healthcare much easier. Um, uh, but it also, you're actually talking to, to real doctors. Um, and so there's actually an interesting talent model change uh, that accompanies the channel, uh, the channel disruption. Manufacturing, you know, a whole bunch of things going on. The, you know, probably the, the easiest one to, for everybody to think about is uh, automotive and how with the path we're on appears to be uh, moving from people being manufacturers of automobiles to eventually the people buy transportation as a service. Um, and uh, that changes dramatically uh, the capital of who owns what. Um, and uh, the, um, um, you know, things like dealer networks, uh, the, the repair and maintenance, um, et cetera. So a couple of themes kind of across this. Um, one, you see a lot of channels being disrupted and how those channels are managed and utilized. You see new use cases, so the nature of what's being purchased, why it's being purchased and consumed all change. Um, the economic structures change significantly, and then um, often the uh, talent models um, uh, uh, either are obviously changing or have a, a knock-on effect once people move to optimize it. Yeah, so I think all that, we, you know, like we showed on the retail with the Amazon here where, you know, Amazon wasn't a surprise to anybody, it hasn't been a surprise for over a decade. And yet uh, it took a long time for the, the lag effect to come into play where it really started to make a difference in the store closures and the brick and mortar. And I think the same thing is going to be in play here. I mean, you know, I've been interacting with the healthcare system recently and I keep praying that they get that right, but I'm not optimistic it's going to happen within the next decade. But, you know, the thought process is you got to get going now so you get that momentum. So when it reaches critical mass, you're there and you are a leader in that price space. 
So let's move on to the next uh, ch business challenge, uh, and that's back to the talent conversation. Uh, we've got all this disruption in business going on. And at the same time, we've got a fundamental change in what's going on with our talent. And so um, you can see here, uh, you know, unemployment rates for both the U.S. and, and Europe have, uh, you know, the, the financial, you can see the financial crisis here when they spiked uh, in a little, little later in Europe. But what you're going to see now, if you look at 2018, is we are hitting generational lows in the unemployment rates. So we've got a great economy uh, that's helping things. We've got a, some aging population demographics that are working against, are working to create unemployment, but they're working against the available workforce, the talent pool. And then we've also got uh, a lot of different changes in the immigration policies that are going to potentially uh, mitigate uh, or, or prevent immigration at the same numbers we've had in the past, which will actually be probably a bad news story in the long run in terms of talent. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's new news on the last page here, but the second page, I think maybe a, a bit of an eye opener for many people that don't see this kind of statistic every day. Um, and this is what we, what we call, this is, I think it's called the JOLT report. It is the number of unemployed people per job opening in the U.S. Okay. And so if you look back at the financial crisis there, where you see almost seven people were looking for each, seven people were looking for each job, uh, looking at each job opening. Um, we now, and this, and this series of data doesn't go back too far, so we have you know, just a, a 10 year horizon to look at or so. Um, but what you see here is we've reached a point now where there are more people looking, I'm sorry, there are more job openings than the people are looking for work. So if you think you've got a, 100 jobs you wanna get open, you have open and you wanna get fulfilled in your, your next year's uh, plan, there's only gonna be 90 people looking for those 100 jobs. And so, you know, when I was referencing in the opening statement about, you know, executives worried about top talent and getting the best talent on their team and they knowing how critical that is to making business uh, go fast and, and, and do well. Um, imagine that you still have that problem. In addition to that, you can't even get the rank and file because you can't get people to show up at your doorstop to even apply for jobs. And when you start to see this, it's pretty startling. Then if we bring in the business challenge number three here, where we go back to the pricing and cost pressures. Um, Again, we've been able to import deflation to a large degree via China and India over the last decade or so. And if you look at here, the reality is we've barely had any inflation for the last five or so years, uh, up until very recently. And now what you're starting to see is the impact of price increases are starting to be felt here. And what's kind of not, you know, we've got it spiking up, going up, starting to, you know, past 2%. I think it's in the two and a half percent, um, depending on which set metric you use. Um, but this does not reflect some of the most recent changes. It does not reflect the impact of tariffs that we are being uh, uh, tantalized with in the, in the uh, political and economic realms. Uh, but those are going to eventually hit the real markets here very soon if they, if they do go through with those. And then second of all is the talent conversation. And I think we've all talked to here, you know, you know, Amazon and Target and uh, Walmart all talking about min raising their minimum wage from, you know, the national legal limit is $7.25, but all those retailers are now talking about, hey, I'm going to have a $12 minimum, I'm going to have a $15 minimum, and those things are just now going into effect. I think the Amazon stuff was effective either November 1st or December 1st, but now you're starting to see, a, 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 you know, that wage pressure starting to build in here, and there's no way that's not going to show up in the CPI and, and other inflation indicators over time. So um, those are still yet to be felt. So those are kind of the, 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 the factoids around that. Now we wanted to kind of talk about the responses to that and look at the, you know, what are those business challenges or what, how, what are people doing about those business challenges? And so I'm gonna turn it over to Salil to talk about uh, some of the uh, impacts of talent and the levers that we can, we can uh, be deployed there. Sure. Uh, so, uh, so taking the first uh, uh, response lever and talking about the talent response lever, uh, this is uh, while this is largely in response to the talent and the skills shortage business challenge, but it also uh, is partially in response to the other business challenges that uh, Michael and Eric just talked about. And here, uh, what we are really talking about is uh, 
a, a skills and a talent shortage, uh, particularly in the United States that we that, that we just saw. And what are the response levers that uh, companies are um, adopting to mitigate this challenge? Uh, the biggest response lever uh, that it that 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 you will see in some time uh, being played out is the focus on productivity and also talent retention, and also recalibrating and and changing the way companies think about acquiring the talent. So that's that's really the response lever that companies are uh, and enterprises are thinking about. Uh, so if you can move to the next page, uh, please. And uh, it is uh, it may not be very surprising to to all of you that uh, talent is a big issue for enterprises. And uh, this also got reflected in our survey that we just completed with enterprises, where talent was talent shortage was one of the key business challenge, and specifically uh, within this, uh, the most significant impact that it had. Uh, was on hampering innovation, also delaying project implementation, and also adversely impacting customer service. So these three uh, specific impacts were most talked about by enterprises when they talked about a talent issue. And while the last two around project implementation and customer service may be pretty uh, pretty self-evident, uh, but the first one around hampering innovation uh, was something that was uh, was certainly uh, logical, but uh, uh, but 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 was certainly some something which we which we didn't anticipate as a as a as a predominant response. So specifically talking about all these three uh, you know uh, all these three impacts in detail, the first one around the hampering uh, hampering of innovation uh, is really to do with uh, the fact that uh, there is limited or in uh, or in, in some cases very negligible ready to hire talent. Especially as we, as companies are thinking about digital rotation and uh, looking at niche skills, uh, uh, this is significantly hampering uh, the ability of enterprises to innovate, especially in new areas, in new products, business segments, and markets. And there is also another angle around innovation and, and the impact of talent, which is which is to do with how companies uh, aren't able to build a culture of innovation and uh, uh, and an ecosystem wherein they can uh, they can really promote talent uh, to to foster more innovation and that's that's the, that's the biggest uh, impact that companies uh, mentioned about the talent shortage issue uh, the project implementation delay is to really to do with uh, uh, the fact that given uh, limited availability and also in some cases higher turnover uh, this is uh, really you know uh, you know impacts the implementation of critical projects and uh, one of the important things uh, which enterprises have also mentioned uh, is that it also impacts customer service because uh, yeah, there is a there's a higher degree of correlation many studies have shown before uh, that there is a fairly good correlation between dipping of customer satisfaction levels and much you know related to higher employee attrition and also talent retention uh, there's also aspect of there's also an aspect around lower trainability of key skills, uh, and that's something which is also impacting how customers perceive the services that enterprises are rendering to them. Uh, so, if, so, so, so talent has, you know, uh, been acknowledged as a big issue by enterprises, and uh, as as we saw just now, it's it's impacting many of the strategic strategic levers. Uh, if we if we really move to the next page and talk about what implications it has uh, in terms of how companies are responding, uh, you know, res are responding to these levers. What you see on the left-hand side is the expectation of enterprises uh, in terms of their revenue and headcount growth. Uh, and this is again borne out from the survey that we just concluded. Uh, and as you can see, uh, uh, a lot of uh, responses are uh, expecting either an optimistic or a marginal growth. So enterprises do expect revenue growth in 2019. At the same time, many of the enterprises are not expecting a significant increase in headcount, uh, and this is predominantly to do with the talent shortage uh, problem that Michael and Eric just talked about. So uh, the, the 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 clear implication of both those two uh, factors is there is a much stronger need, even much more stronger than what it was before, for enterprises to focus on productivity. Now, this is not to say that productivity wasn't important earlier, but just looking at the, the dynamics of talent and also the expectations on revenue and the business sentiment and the, uh, and the state of the economy, we, uh, we strongly believe that 2019 will be about enterprises focusing on uh, both creating uh, strategic levers to improve productivity, plus also creating a more enabling environment to ensure uh, productivity across process, people, and technology uh, being at the forefront uh, of their uh, of their response lever on talent. Uh, right. and so, if you can, so, so, well, if you can't hire them, you got to make the, the existing workforce that much more productivity, more more productive, so you can get the growth that you're looking for. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and this is where I think the the digital disruption is not just obviously in the business model, but it's actually how work gets done. So this is less about hey, let's crank more hours out. It's let's get more out of those hours. So how do we enable enable productivity versus um, um, uh, I work with somebody who called it a flogging for excellence. You, there's only so much you can do. To squeeze more juice out. You've got to change the game. And technology is the big hope. Um, right. And then if we look at uh, the next slide, please. Uh, what is what is also interesting is uh, that when it comes to some of the low cost locations, especially India as an example, which is mentioned on this page, uh, they are actually facing a very different type of talent challenge. So so uh, we, we talked about talent shortage and the implication on productivity improvement because of that. Uh, in case of low cost locations, there is actually an issue around talent redundancy. And uh, there have been many studies done on this. And now uh, uh, within Everest Group, we also did a recent study, uh, which uh, which basically said that uh, roughly 500,000 FTEs, which is a third of the existing BPM workforce in India, uh, may need to be replaced because of uh, because of changing nature uh, of scales as well as automation. So uh, it's it's not like people will uh, uh, you know uh, that, that 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 people will suddenly lose their job, but they will. There there is a redundancy, there is a significant redundancy challenge which the low cost locations are facing, which is impacting their way to uh, do service delivery in a more effective manner. And this and this is also a manifestation of talent shortage, but it's a uh, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a different manifestation of uh, uh, the, the the overall talent issue. Specifically, we see this uh, very significant in the vertical specific and horizontal specific BPS functions, but also in uh, contact center where uh, where we see anywhere between one four to roughly half of the uh, of the workforce uh, in the Indian BPM workforce industry, as an example, which may which is likely to face some redundancy issue. And this is an example from India, but this is something that we see uh, also impacting other low cost and uh, moderate cost locations globally. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Eric and Michael to talk about the implications of this and uh, uh, the, the response levers from an enterprise perspective. Yeah, so well, my takeaway on that is, you know, we got talent challenges in two parts of the world that are very, very different. Um, I think the challenge that India and other low cost locations are going to is a skills thing, but that can be that can be upskilled and reskilled that workforce. And, um, you know, that is a more shorter term disruption um, to, to, the, to the ecosystem. But the challenge that the U.S. and Europe are going to be is the bodies just don't exist. Yeah. Well, and you've, I think. Japan has been living with that reality yes, for a while, yes. and that's a lot of why you see um, some of the automation technology being very aggressively adopted there and in some much more innovative ways. Um, in fact, I, um, I saw something in the last few months, you know, they're trying to um, say it's actually a beautiful example, maybe uh, overhyped in the media, but it was basically um, using robots inside of restaurants to help serve people, which, which by itself is, is interesting in a way of dealing with labor shortage. Um, but interestingly, they were trying to control the robots by people that were physically disabled and not able and had to work remotely, which is you know, tapping an alternative talent pool. So it's a interesting knock on effects of when you're really pressed to innovate when you just don't have the bodies um, and the things you may do. Yeah, my answer has been I've been trying to get my uh, son, and, son and daughter in law to have more babies. But I think that's going to solve the uh, that will take about 20 more years for that has a has a significant impact. If we can go on to um, uh, the next slide, please. So, um, so in terms of what do we see from um, sort of a services industry view on how to how to deal with some of the, the these talent and skill shortages? Um, the first uh, first point, which I think we've already started hammering, is uh, productivity. Um, we've um, uh, in some ways this is part of why RPA has taken off so nicely. It's part of why um, some of the the AI and other other things are um, helpful. Um, we actually think it's an area that people have not as explicitly focused on, and it's it's a harder and slippery one, and slippier one in certain ways. Um, but uh, but there are ways to actually improve productivity, both in how the work is designed, how people are deployed against it, and the technologies used to uh, enable it. Um, the second point is um, uh, you have to uh, make sure you're uh, keeping who you have. It's going to be a very competitive uh, labor market. Um, this is where um, evolving people, evolving their roles, and the, the reskilling and redeploying uh, become important. Um, we don't have everything we need for the future. We have to we have to build the future. 
which then takes to the, the third and final point, which is um, for the new folks you are, the organizations are bringing in from a talent acquisitions, you have to have the, um, uh, the future in mind. Um, and this is gonna be less about um, hiring what you truly need and more about um, hiring to enable you to build what you will need. Um, and so what goes with this is a point of view on learning and development, um, how career paths can evolve, and in general, um, uh, um, capabilities versus um, specific jobs. Um, uh, as things change fast and it's uncertain, we need to be able to be agile in how a talent can be used and the more agile organizations can be um, through how they've designed things, the, the easier it will be to uh, keep pace. Okay, great. So that we, we've uh, talked about the talent and I think uh, we're, we are in violent agreement on the need to get more pro productivity out of the workforce that we have. Um, so let's, let's look at those uh, things happening in the digital and the technology space, uh, what we found there. And in this next slide here, we're going to talk about uh, both an enterprise view and a service provider view. Okay. Um, so uh, from uh, the surveys we did, we looked at um, both how the service providers were investing in things and how the enterprises were. You see kind of the layout of a number of uh, dots here. Um, uh, next. Okay. In the kind of the upper right hand corner, um, you see quite a bit of alignment um, between some of the, the most popular technologies, the analytics, the automation and the cloud. Um, you know, these are essential. There's you know big investment and big adoption from uh, from uh, um, sort of both both organizations. If we go to the kind of the next cluster, which is uh, a little bit further to the left, uh, meaning that the service providers are investing um, somewhat less than the enterprises are prioritizing it. Um, you see a, a cluster of three things, and I think each of these represents a different story. Um, I think the the cybersecurity, um, the relative emphasis on the enterprises is they're scared. Um, this is really important to them to not um, have a, um, a target moment, a Marriott moment, all these <laughs> moments that seem are uh, seems almost like becoming uh, a weekly event. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's uh, if you, if, I guess if you haven't had a, a bad headline, um, um, you know, count yourself incredibly lucky. Um, the you know, mobility, um, I see this as just a practical thing that people need to be able to do to deal with all these shifting channels, shifting expectations, et cetera. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's a reality for enterprises that just to implement things and to get into um, OT versus just IT, um, to uh, uh, you know, run the Internet of Things, et cetera. They, mobility becomes very important. It may, it may seem straightforward in some ways to the service providers. But for the enterprises, they have a lot of stuff to figure out. There's a lot of customer experience uh, stuff, um, new use cases, et cetera. And in the advanced, uh, the advanced automation, I see this really as the enterprises pinning a lot of their hopes on this. Um, they don't know exactly what it's going to be able to do, and they can they can um, imagine shooting for the moon. Um, but it's uh, so it's so it's very important to them. Um, but they don't quite know where it's going to be. So in some ways, the mobility they know it can be done. This is this is a hope for the future. And it's more nichey too. I mean, if you look at the general RPA, that yes. applies in a universal kind of state. Yeah. And right now we're treating it as a cluster. The reality is there's many, many, many things underneath it. And as everybody matures, um, the it will it'll break apart into more easily definable sub segments. Okay. Um, then the next uh, one, in, in some ways, this is uh, a, this is uh, it relevant, but also misleading. This is blockchain. So we have blockchain, um, not not uh, particularly high for either of the service providers or the enterprises. And in an absolute sense, this is this is true. The number that are um, meanfully prioritizing it is less than than uh, the others. What it hides, though, is that um, uh, blockchain could potentially be a more fundamental um, change than these others. But the nature of it is something where you have to be able to create network effects in order to really get it to scale. And not every organization thinks they're going to be able to do that. And so they're watching others um, and maybe recognizing that they're going to be a member of the network versus the you're kind of the um, the owner of the, the, the platform. So they may participate as opposed to create. So unless you're the unless you're the leading one or two player in the a segment, you can't lead the ecosystem that's required to make this happen. Yeah. So what you have here more so than the others is business strategy. 
um, uh, being a, a critical factor to consider as opposed to just, you know, technology and user um, factors. Okay, so um, the other way to look at the uh, how people are solving the problem is follow the money. And uh, one of the questions we asked uh, was around what are the key buying centers and where is the uh, the most growth in budget. So this is not an absolute where is the most money, but this is where the most growth is happening. And so we asked both the enterprise and the service providers. And what you're going to quickly see up at the very top there is the chief digital officer. And again, I think this is a reflection of everything we've been talking about in terms of needing to uh, go digital, get that productivity. Um, you'll also see the circle and colors, the technology head of business units. And I think the, the role of the chief digital officer is really kind of to apply the technology and the technology head of business. I look at that as almost being one and the same. Um, and, and there's, you know, this, these roles are, are still evolving here. Uh, so you see increase in both and in, in, in budgets here for sure. Uh, but they also, some of these are still within the domain of the CIO. So it's a little, little, little hard to say that this is absolute uh, spend, but you can see relative spend to, to these roles. Another one I'd pick out of here would be the chief marketing officer. Uh, again, very business orientated, uh, not so much infrastructure, not so much network type, type stuff, but really focused in on the, the business context of what, how do we use technology to make more, more impact for the organization. All right, so one of the, the, the things that we've been working hard on is uh, an overall digital capability platform. And, uh, and what we're doing here is trying to lay out the landscape as we see 2019. And so I'm gonna build this stack from the bottom up here. And what we've been trying to do is kind of layer out all these digital things and onto one piece of paper and one, one overall uh, platform view. And so um, the, the bottom layer, focus on the performance, that's the, the, the cloud, the networks, development um, DevOps, it's really about driving the scalability and performance. It's really about being able to provide that engine for the organization. The next layer up, really moving to the automation layer. Uh, lots and lots of excitement around RPA, uh, some of the, the IT applications, but really about driving process efficiency. A huge excitement in the RPA, I can't under understate that. Uh, I, I've done many pres whole presentations on that, uh, and, and there are lots, lots of good things happening there. The next layer up would be the insights layer and uh, really trying to, to apply it and really how do you mine the data, how do you, how do you get more out of it, how, how do you get the insights, how do you help your targeting, all that, but ultimately driving decisions. And then finally, in the, in the overall stack here is really the interaction layers. So that's how do you communicate, how do you drive that stakeholder uh, experience, whether that's the customer or your employees. And then we layer on uh, some of the other enablers on the left-hand side with the uh, innovation ecosystem, uh, some APIs and IoT. And so if you take this back and look at this, this is what we're saying is digital in 2019. Now, you can use uh, an overall uh, framework uh, conversation like this to talk about in many different ways. So one of the things that, you know, the, you can take each one of those circles in the box um, and say that there are, there are potentially 10, 20, or even more individual vendors providing individual uh, innovative solutions in those boxes. Um, and I think that's one way to look at this. Um, but don't know that stuff static. So what's happening in these things is they're starting to, the, nobody's staying in their circles. Everybody's kind of expanding out of their circles, but there's so many different opportunities. Then there's also the view of if you were to go to a, uh, a systems integrator. So if you looked at an Accenture or TCS or, a, you know, any of the many large players out there, what they are trying to do is help clients assemble all of these components. And so what they are doing with is, is providing a, a, a holistic viewpoint, maybe not every single box, circle in here, but trying to provide um, capability across all the layers. And they bring that, uh, their value add is, first of all, they can, they can add some uh, technology on top to help integrate it all. And then second of all, they can bring a um, uh, industry specific application. Yeah, so the, I think it, it also eventually raises the question of, will these things actually manifest in a like true, fully complete platform? Um, the reality is probably not one single platform for a particular case will probably be a lot of this, but still stuff will have to be plugged in, configured, may or may not be um, uh, part of the thing that you know, one, one vendor is able to provide. Um, 
And then kind of the closely related thing is some of these things like say RPA, many organizations are trying to build an RPA um, center of excellence that is intended to have an enterprise mandate. Um, and uh, you know, maybe the data warehouse, et cetera, intend to be enterprise. The, the reality is that the construct of how all this hangs together into a platform, most organizations will probably have multiple forms of the platforms and the platforms may intersect with each other as well. Um, so what's maybe on the, the, the customer and the supply channel side may be very different than the repair and maintenance and the, um, uh, you know, the, the um, undergirding um, operations. Okay, and so I think you know the the the, cha the, the challenge and the opportunity on a, on a on a framework like this is to really think about it. You know, we're showing what we think it is in 2019. We're going to be doing a lot of analysis on the different capabilities of different both uh, individual uh, software vendors and and uh, and then also the service providers as a whole that are integrating all this together. But I can assure you, whatever you see and think it is today, at the end of 2018 you can expect massive change going forward in 2019. And there's so much money being thrown at this and the velocity of change is so rapid, it's hard to even imagine. Yeah. And that's why I think trying to figure out where are the winning platforms that people will build around and will consolidate, I think will be is, is, is a critical part of ensuring that the decisions you make, even though they may not be perfect, um, they, uh, they generally advance you towards the future. Yeah, and I think I'd urge, you know, not only to look at what the vendor capabilities are, but understand how you are performing against your peers in this conversation. So as an enterprise, so stay tuned on this one. Be a lot of exciting uh, analysis we're going to do here to try to help decipher this. And uh, um, I should also say there's a lot of hype here in many of these little individual circles. So we want to try to help uh, delineate hype from, from reality. Okay, all right, so our third business challenge, a lever to, 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 uh, to respond to the business challenges of sourcing. Uh, Salil, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Uh, sure, Michael. Uh, so as we look at the third response lever on sourcing, uh, uh, we've looked at a uh, couple of things. One is what are the key propositions which enterprises are, uh, are really valuing and what is important to them? And then what's really the implication of these uh, value propositions and important ones into the sourcing uh, models and what kind what kind of changes do we expect as we head into the next year? Uh, so if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, what you see on the left are the winning value propositions that enterprises really cherish, uh, and uh, these may not be very surprising, uh, but uh, you know these continue to remain very important uh, around you know cost efficiency, uh, you know be, be able to execute projects more efficiently and quick and quickly. So timeliness is important, uh, cost is important, and access to in demand skills is important. So in some ways. These are, uh, you know, manifestations on, uh, on on the pricing aspect, on on productivity aspect, as well as on talent aspect. Uh, this uh, was borne out by the responses in this survey, uh, as well as uh, what we have been seeing and observing over the last uh, over the last many years. What is important to note, however, is that despite all the talk around. Uh, uh, you know, the value arbitrage being more important than the cost arbitrage, uh, cost is still continuing to be an important place. So it is it is cost in addition to some of the other value propositions. It is not uh, the one versus the other. So cost still continues to be an important value proposition. Now, as we look at these value propositions, what is the implication of this on the sourcing models uh, that, you know, that we anticipate going into 2019? The first one is really around how do enterprises think about the mix between insourcing and outsourcing. Uh, by insourcing, uh, it, it may mean GICs or shared services, but it may also mean uh, using internal delivery teams to support work. Uh, outsourcing, of course, is uh, using a service provider uh, combination or, or a single service provider. Uh, the second implication is really how do enterprises think about the number, the role, as well as the nature of work which is being done by the service provider? So the entire question on the service provider portfolio. And the third one is the implication on how do uh, uh, the, the various pricing models uh, you know, come, come into play? And are there newer pricing models which enterprises are much more open to exploring? So we'll address each of these implications uh, one by one. Uh, moving to the first implication on the yes, sourcing sure. model. Yes, so if I, if I might just, we'll, on these following slides, uh, we'll be presenting sort of the aggregate uh, view from across the survey. 
um, the, the reality is underneath these is there's lots of factors at play due to the, the specifics of the company, um, their starting point, the nature of the services, et cetera. And one of the, the questions that I typically get is, you know, so like, what's the right sourcing model? What's the right portfolio? What's the right um, pricing model? And, and in, in generally speaking, there's not really a right answer. The way that I tend to think about it and see see um, what people are really optimizing against, or sorry, how they should, how they're really um, uh, orienting against this is to what extent do they believe they're trying to optimize a service versus they're trying to um, create kind of innovation um, and change related to a service. On the things that op they're trying to optimize, there will be a heavier skew towards outsourcing, offshoring, because um, they see it's more static. To be heavier skewed towards fewer players um, to uh, to create volume to um, to create that optimization, and it will tend to be um, a desire to move towards a more predictable pricing structure, whether it be a fixed cost or an output based thing, where they kind of know what it is in the budget. So in effect, they want the optimization, want benefits, but they don't want to spend a lot of time on it. On the innovation, um, this is where they'll tend to be. Um, uh, more interested in something that's internal or a more intimate service, more onshore, more agile, more co-sourcing. Um, they'll, they'll tend to be more um, more uh, types of groups involved because there's uh, generally uh, unique skill sets. There's also uncertainty, uh, which creates kind of proliferation. And then finally, because of all that change, they'll tend to want simpler pricing models that may be more input oriented because they don't want to spend a lot of time trying to define the outcome or the, the fixed cost because they are trying to innovate. They just, they don't know where it's going to go. So broadly speaking, you know, when people are trying to think about what works well, I'd say think about the extent to which you're trying to optimize it and kind of hold it static and just make it better versus you're trying to innovate and create. And then, and then from that, those attributes will guide you a long ways towards what, what will tend to work best. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Eric, and that's also reflecting in the um, uh, in some of the responses that we got and uh, the conversations we've, we've, we've been having with the enterprises on the sourcing model changes. Uh, so talking about the first implication that, that you see on this slide, uh, we, we certainly see uh, uh, you know, an anticipation of changes to sourcing mix by many enterprises uh, as companies are thinking about optimizing and also uh, thinking about innovating. Uh, they're thinking about the best way in which they can leverage the internal as well as the external delivery models. Uh, and and as, and as you can see in the chart, roughly a third of the enterprises are thinking about uh, more outsourcing relative to 2018. And then uh, roughly a fourth of them are thinking about more insourcing relative to 2018. So uh, there is there is definitely uh, a significant share on both ends of the spectrum. The the uh, when, when companies think about uh, the make versus buy question. There are many factors which come into play. Uh, it is around cost and uh, the financial implication uh, of uh, how companies view the two uh, the two sourcing models or combinations of those sourcing models. There is also a question around what kind of talent competencies do enterprises want to develop internally, uh, and then there is also a question around the degree of uh, control uh, that enterprises would need to keep uh, for a particular function or process or an activity, uh, given considerations on regulations, IP, data protection uh, may also be uh, may also be specific business nuances which uh, which need to be considered. So there are multiple factors in play. Uh, however, it's uh, it's definitely uh, important to note here that. Uh, we, we certainly do expect some changes uh, to the sourcing mix as we head into 2019. Uh, if you look at the second uh, implication around the uh, provider mix, uh, and this is this is also something uh, which is pretty interesting. Uh, what you see here is uh, there are multiple response options which enterprises have as they think about their provider portfolio. Uh, they could either think about making significant changes, which may mean completely, uh, you know, having a new set of providers or a significant new number of providers, uh, you know, as well as type of work they're outsourcing to service providers, or it may uh, simply mean some minor tweaks to their provider portfolio, which may mean some rebalancing of work, but not really making uh, far reaching changes. And what you see here is that there is a fairly even response across uh, each of these options, uh, which is also a reflection of the various stages of uh, provider portfolio uh, maturity that many many enterprises have, you know, are, are at, plus at various stages of evolution as well. So there, so there are many enterprises which are 
perfectly happy with their service provider relationships and therefore they're thinking about more ways to optimize uh, and therefore tweaks and rebalancing is probably the order of the day but there are others where uh, either there is a, there is an end of term which is coming up or there are significant challenges or concerns that enterprises have with their provider relationships or it could be simply about uh, testing new service providers uh, especially as you think about uh, launching new services and product portfolios, uh, which, which may also be causing them to think about significant uh, changes to their provider mix. So it's a, it's a fairly uh, distributed uh, mix here. And something that, that is also borne out by our conversations uh, with enterprises uh, as you think about 2019. Uh, and then the third implication, which is on which is on page number uh, 26, is really around the pricing model and what kind of uh, changes do we anticipate on that front. Um, uh, the one clear uh, trend that we are picking up, and it's also borne by data, is enterprises are clearly showing an intent to move from to traditional pricing models to uh, some of these more uh, relatively more newer pricing models, which is specifically on outcome and outcome based pricing. Uh, and you can see on the chart here, uh, we've, we have looked at the percentage of spend across uh, the different pricing models, and this is aggregate data across technology services, business process services, contact center work. Uh, we've looked at historical data as well as forward looking views. Uh, and clearly, uh, the input-based as well as the fixed price models, which have traditionally been used for uh, for uh, many services across multiple enterprises, uh, are likely to see a, a reduction in their share. Uh, you'll uh, you'll be likely to see much more uh, instances of outcome and output-based pricing. Uh, while this is a generic statement, uh, 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 broadly applicable uh, across all sectors and functions, uh, we we do expect some changes uh, and some differences across uh, various categories. So, for example, in in contact center or customer experience, uh, it's somewhat harder. Uh, to often define a mutually agreed upon outcome, which the, both the service provider and the enterprise, you know, agrees upon. Uh, whereas in other functions like, uh, uh, you know, F, you know, FPNA or APAR uh, accounts payable receivable, uh, it's somewhat more uh, relatively easier, uh, easier thing to do. And therefore, we we definitely see variations in where we see more instances of outcome and output based pricing. But in general, this is a trend that we do expect uh, to uh, see intensified uh, over the next uh, over the next year or so. Yeah, so well, I, I look at that trend and, uh, you know, I go, I go back through my career and, and it's become coming full circle on that. So, you know, the the idea to put it based on, you know, we had a lot of labor based uh, contracts put in place when we moved to low cost locations where labor arbitrage was a primary value proposition. Um, but prior to that, we used to do most of our contracts and outsourcing based on uh, output based. And so it was a per claim, a per check in account. And it uh, looks like with the the emphasis moving away from uh, labor arbitrage as the primary value proposition and moving more toward uh, looking at the outcome or output, it looks like we've come full circle. Okay. All right. So, uh, so as we bring into the, the the presentation to conclusion here, um, industry optimism is high, and I might just change the, the back here, maybe and rising, um, maybe what based on the results we saw here, or maybe some of the last headlines in the last few weeks here, maybe it's not rising quite as fast as it was, or maybe even peaking, uh, but definitely still an overall optimistic tone. Uh, enterprise automation is definitely red hot. Um, I don't care where, how you want to measure it, uh, whether it's on labor flows or talent p p talent uh, shortages there specifically in that in that domain, or you want to look at it from investment spend, it's a hot at all levels. Um, the adoption is uh, new business models and pricing and, and talent challenges are a key issues for the enterprises. Um, you know, capital investment and some of the government noise and regulation are not, so. Um, we'll continue to hammer on the talent and the uh, the digital the chief digital officer is gaining relative uh, relatively relative budget power there, and uh, we we prove that to be interesting. So uh, with that, we got a few minutes left for questions, and I wanted to go to one here, Eric. I don't know if you see any you want to answer, but the one I wanted to hit here was uh, the question was, you know, is the talent is there specific areas for the talent challenge? Uh, yeah, are there specific skills that are in demand or in shortage? And the way I'd answer that is, you know, there's always been and there will always be a, sh a shortage of the hot topics or hot 
hot uh, skills. So the latest, greatest technology will always be hot. And, uh, you know, until we crank up the resources to, to, uh, to, 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 to help uh, enter that, mark, that space. So RPA, I know India is cranking up tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of resources there. Uh, but RPA is red hot area, AI, same things like that. But I don't know that, that that's new news. That's been around for as long as I can remember. Um, but what I think is different this time is the general shortage of arms and legs. So in the general economy. And, you know, you can point to the, go back to the, you know, Amazon and, and Target and Walmart raising their their minimum wage to 12 to $15 uh, for them, they're not doing it because they want to be nice. They're doing it because they need people. And the only way they're going to com compete pe with people is go steal it from somebody else. Uh, if, if there's more job openings than talent, you got to, you got to, one of the easiest levers to pull is price. So if you increase the salaries or the hourly rate, I will tell you that, you know, I live here in Dallas and, uh, you know, I see hot help wanted signs everywhere I go. What I've seen more recently, though, is not only help wanted signs, but signing bonuses for minimum wage jobs. So, you know, the, the desperation peer, appears to be to getting people to uh, even fulfill roles. And that's going to cause chronic uh, challenges, increasing uh, inflation rates. Uh, you know, attrition rates are going to move up because people have more opportunities. Uh, there's a, a whole vicious circle there that's, that, that we haven't experienced in, you know, in a long time at least in our generation uh, is going to come up, come there and it's going to, it's not going to go away. You know, unless we open our borders and we have a lot more babies and, you know, immigration and uh, I don't even know how you can do it. You're going to, you're going to have to look to things like uh, productivity to get there. Yep. Yeah. I'm scanning through and trying to answer some of the questions. So I guess the one I'll be easier to talk about than answer. Um, there's a question about what are the drivers of insourcing? Um, and this is part of why I made the point earlier about there's a lot of different things going on. So if somebody has a large established internal delivery model, um, but also using a lot of outsourcing, um, and they're in a segment that's you know, prone to need a lot of digital innovation, um, then they, you know, they may very easily want to insource in order to um, feel they have more control over that innovation versus trying to establish statements of work and manage teams that may be at different sites, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by contrast, uh, there's organizations that maybe um, aren't large themselves, can't necessarily, um, don't necessarily have the sophistication or desire to um, develop um, um, uh, um, meaningful uh, analytics, digital skills, et cetera. And it may be the best way for them to get the town is to kind of buy access to it through somebody else who's able to attract and develop that talent. And so um, those, some of those spaces and say engineering services, uh, data and analytics, um, et cetera, you see you know, some people saying the only way I can really get to that and the time I need with who I am is to buy it externally. But yet you'll see others who um, actually think they can attract it. Maybe they have the right type of brand um, maybe they've got a different scale, and so they will they will go for new gen stuff and try to build it themselves uh, um, as well. Um, it, basically, it's a for any for any company of size, it's a hybrid model, and they're going to keep going back and forth as the nature of what they're trying to chain, what they're trying to do um, shifts. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that one is better or worse; it just means one more or less aligned to how they want to manage things and what objectives they want to achieve. Yeah, there's a related question here, and how do you view the future of GICs, and uh, how should they change? And and there's a, another couple of questions around. You know, we, we we pointed out the difference in the talent challenges between U.S. Europe versus India and other low cost locations. And uh, you know, the answer I, I give there is I think GICs and shared services organizations as a whole are going to continue to thrive. And part of it is because they do can hire the bodies. There may be a mismatch right now in the skill sets and needing to upskill and reskill. But I look at that as a two to three year problem. Uh, and knowing that the the one thing that I've always underestimated in my 20 plus years as an analyst has been, you know, the impact of India and their ability to bring bodies to bear. And so when India gets gets fixated on, uh, hey, I want to train a certain skill set, they can bring tens and th hundreds of thousands of bodies to to, uh, to that skill set pretty quickly on a relative basis. And so. Uh, while there may be a mismatch in, in the short term, the long term is they can bring it to bear. And I think 
uh, global organizations are going to look at it and say, listen, if I, if I can't raise the price on my, or, you know, raise the salaries, I can't offer signing bonuses, I can't do any things, they're going to go where the, where the arms and legs are. And I think that's, uh, uh, you know, going to be certainly going to be productivity is one answer. Okay. Great. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap up two, two closing comments. Uh, yes, people, you will get an email to download um, the document in a couple of days. You can also do a recording. Um, and then second, um, the questions we haven't been able to answer are captured and we'll sort through those and try to get back to people separately. Thanks everyone for your time today.